All right, so let's look at growing in discipleship. Discipleship is something that Christians talk about a lot. It's, it's important that we actually know what discipleship is, how to do it, and also how to grow in it. So let's just kick off with a definition of discipleship. This is a definition I came up with when I did my doctoral studies, and I, I wrote a dissertation called uh, The Image of God and Council Estate Discipleship. And one of my conclusions was that discipleship is God's image bearers spreading God's rule broadly and deeply as they hear and speak God's truth and become more like God's image, Christ. And I won't unpack all of that there because it, it would take a long time. But basically, as we disciple people, we are spreading God's rule broadly to other people but at the same time we're spreading it deeply in a way that hopefully impacts our hearts and also impacts the hearts of people we're discipling and the process involves us hearing God's word and then speaking it to others so so we get God's word and then we pass it on to other people and along this process all of us image bearers become more like Christ and for this to work well we need a system whereby Everyone is equipped to make disciples who then go on to make disciples who then go on to make disciples, right? Okay. And so what I came up with was the urban catechism, the urban catechism, part one, part two, and part three. And then the, the fourth thing we use is called image bearers. All of them are A5 booklets. The urban, urban catechism part one also comes with a uh, an A4 size teacher's guide for the person who is catechizing the other person. This word catechism and catechize comes from the Greek word katecheo, which is used in the New Testament to instruct someone. And at some point in church history, it ended up being the, the, the term used for when someone is interested in the faith, but they're not baptized yet you put them through catechesis. You put them through some instruction that gets them ready to understand properly who God is, what the gospel is, and so that they are ready to, to get, get, get baptized. However, when I'm talking about catechism, I'm talking about discipling any and everyone, including people who've been believers for years and years and years. And this process is something that blesses me. Like when I take people through the urban catechism, I find I grow a lot in the process. We're doing it together, you know. Um, so it's it, so, yeah. Anyway, this this is the system that I came up with. It's a system that's worked well on our council estate. I've got a friend um, who uses the urban catechism a lot on, on his estate as well. When Well, I've got more than one friend who uses it on their estate. I know people who use it around the place and they found it helpful. And I've had other people who aren't involved in council estate ministry who say that they found that urban catechism works really well for them as well. But there's two kind of questions that I often get asked. One is, well, why not just read the Bible? Why not do discipleship by just saying to someone, hey, would you like to start reading the Bible with me? And what I would say is that if we want to make disciples who make disciples, we need a method that anyone can do. Anyone can take the lead in without being a pastor or without being a specialist, without having had some special training. And when you just say to someone, hey, do you want to start reading the Bible with me? What you find is it brings up a lot of questions. People ask all kinds of questions. And unless someone's had a significant amount of training, they're often not ready to answer all those questions. And so then what it means is a lot of people are like, I don't want to do that. I don't want to just you know, go through the Bible with someone. Um, and, and you end up just with a select few who are the disciples, you know. Um, also, when you just say, let's just read the Bible, a lot of people, not everyone, but I found a lot of people say, well, I want to start a Genesis. And Genesis, you know, everything's kind of going okay. You will find some red herrings along the way when they go down certain rabbit holes with you with their questions. And again, you need specialists. But then when they get to Exodus... Halfway through Exodus, it, get, it gets heavy going and then you've got Leviticus and you've got people asking you questions about skin diseases and you're thinking of the skin diseases back then. They're talking about the same as skin diseases we know of today and how does this all work? And 
And, and also, whilst you're going down these rabbit holes, someone else might have some other issues, like maybe they've just beaten someone up and they're kind of getting sidetracked with talking about skin diseases or, you know, um, so what we found is that it's wise to actually consider what are the questions that people are most likely to ask and what are the answers that we can give them from scripture and that's basically how catechism part one started now also people say well why not just do ad hoc discipleship where you've just got people who when a problem comes up in their life you show them what the bible says about it well i'd say one this tends to be a very pastor centered way or specialist centered way or leadership centered way of doing ministry where again it's people who've had a significant amount of training who are equipped with doing discipleship on an, on an ad hoc basis uh I'd, I'd also say that works better with christians people who already have faith uh often uh when you've got someone who isn't a christian at all it is helpful to invite them to some kind of curriculum where you're saying hey let me share with you what my faith is and you can ask questions along the way but two this can result in significant gaps in people's knowledge because if you do stuff on an ad hoc basis people only get equipped with stuff about the problems that they've been facing in their life over the last year or the last two years and it can mean that a whole bunch of people in your church don't get equipped for dealing with other issues that are going to come up in the future and again it's only going to be the pastor or the people on the leadership team or whatever people who've been to bible college who are then able to handle those things so you, you get significant gaps in people's knowledge sometimes people say well this is just what jesus did but when you think about it jesus's disciples most of them you think the way they were raised they would have been raised with some kind of curriculum they would have been taken through the ten commandments they would have regularly sung through the psalms which is a whole curriculum in itself and they would have been uh raised to understand the the, the law and and stuff and they would have the debates of their day going on you know from the different rabbis and stuff so they already had a kind of curriculum if you're doing ministry say like what we're doing on a council estate where you're sometimes working with people who have not had any kind of background uh being uh, uh, in terms of being taught about what christianity is um then you're starting from a different place to where jesus was with his disciples but lastly when you look at church history you see that whether it's been St. Augustine, you know, or if it's been the reformers, you find that by and large, the church throughout history has been like, we need some kind of curriculum to instruct people with so that they understand properly who God is and, and what the, the gospel is. Okay, so what I did was started off writing the urban catechism part one which originally was just looking at what are the most common questions i kept getting asked on my estate and it started off with maybe about 16 questions and taking people through these questions had question and answer and then as i took people through these questions some of them were people who weren't believers yet some of them were people who just become believers but didn't have much background in it they started asking other questions i added that to the catechism and the more people ask questions and i'm talking about thinking of the questions that people asked over a very long period of time you know like years and years and years and 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 basically in the end we ended up with the urban catechism part one which has what, 55 questions in it 55 questions and answers in it and then when someone's been through the urban catechism part one we then encourage them to take someone else through the urban catechism part one we give them a teacher's guide to, to help them take someone else through it um, but they don't really need much from the teacher's guide the teacher's guide basically explains what all the all the, all the pictures are so along the way we have these pictures that basically explain the answers to the questions and the teacher's guide will remind you of what those what those pictures meant and also give a bit more background information also when someone's done the urban catechism part one we encourage them to go on to part two have someone take them through part three and lastly go through a, a resource we have called image bearers and i will take you through those resources right now yeah so first off urban catechism part one one of the questions we kept getting asked a lot was 
okay, so you guys say you're Christians, you say you got new life, but actually you, um, you still do bad things. What's that about? And so in the urban catechism, we talk about how we are made in the image of God, how the image of God got messed up. And then we come on to, to this one here. You might want to pause it later and read through the whole thing. But we then say, look, think of a peach. So you look at the picture of the peach. That reminds the person taking them through the catechism. Oh, tell them about the peach now. And you say, you might get a peach that's not ripe yet, but it's still a peach. It's just not ripe. And the same way, we are new creations. We are Christians. We are in Christ, but we're not ripe yet. We're not going to be ripe till that day Jesus comes back. That's why we still do things wrong. Or like the picture of the sofa, we say to someone, you know, a sofa, like you pull it away from the wall one day and you're like, well, the back of the sofa is a different color to the front. And you realize it's because the sun every day has been casting its rays on the sofa and gradually changing the the color of it bit by bit in the same way bit by bit we get gradually changed by god and it's a gradual process and you can see there in the catechism you know we have we have at the beginning the question then we have the answer and we have bible verses as you go through the answer to look up and some questions about those Bible verses to help you understand how these answers come from, from scripture. And then if you go down to the bottom, we've got these, these orange colored questions, which are the application questions, right? And, and the idea of these, um, it, see, it says point on this chart where you see yourself right now. There's not a right or wrong answer. It's just to get you thinking about stuff. And then can you see areas where you've grown? So you could get really encouraged there where you're like, yeah, do you know what? I, I've grown in this area. Praise God. You know, um, and also are there areas you need to grow more? And, and this is a point where often we, we will get convicted by the Holy Spirit and we'll be like, actually, yeah, there is. And that's a far better way I find of dealing with stuff than going up to someone and saying, I think there's a problem in your life. You know, uh, when it actually comes from people, as they've been looking at God's word, the Holy Spirit convicts hearts. Um, and then the last application question there, do you patiently recognize that others are in this process too? So helping us to be patient with one another as they are gradually becoming more like Christ. And then at the bottom, there's a suggested song. So on the urban ministries website we have songs to go with some of these questions so that people can sing them later uh, either there with their friend or just in the week and then we have a video to watch and then there, there's a there's a little teaching video if someone wants to to watch that um, so so that's the kind of process we go through when we're doing urban catechism part one with someone and i found that when i do it don't matter how many times i've 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 done this. I've taken my family through it. I've taken friends through it. I've taken mature believers through it. I've taken non-Christians through it, um, new believers through it. Every time I find I grow through the process because I'm looking at God's word. The Holy Spirit convicts me of my sin. A friend of mine went through this with me not too long ago, and I was often convicted by his answers to the application questions. And I would be like, I'd be convicted. I'd be like, oh, he's holier than me. And it, it convicted me and inspired me as well at the, at the same time. So that's Urban Catechism Part 1. When you finish it, we then encourage people, will you take someone else through it? Because so much of it is, is picture-based with stories behind the pictures, it's quite easy for you to then take someone else through it. You don't have to have a theology degree or anything. And the, the answer is already there. And sometimes you meet up with someone and they say, actually, I've got a question. Someone came up in a week. Um, and more times I find I can be like, do you know what? That comes up later. Um, shall we turn there now? We look at that question now, you know, which again is one of the benefits of having a pre-prepared curriculum. So when someone's finished Urban Catechism Part 1, and hopefully they've taken someone else through Urban Catechism Part 1, we'd also encourage them to have someone take them through Part 2. Part 2 deals with our salvation and how salvation affects every part of our life. So, for example, at, at one part, we look at what does it mean to be justified? That's part of our salvation, that we've been justified. We look at what it means. You, you can pause that and, and read it later if you want. And then we come on to common lies 
that the doctrine of justification destroys. So here we would we've all we all hear these lies in our heads from time to time, don't they? You're better than other people. And and the truth is, from what you would have just studied with the person, is that you're ungodly and dependent on Jesus's righteousness, just like all of us are, right? Uh, another lie, I need to hide my sin from other Christians. Truth, I'm righteous in God's sight. Knowing this gives me freedom to be honest about my sin. And so we're encouraging people to think about common lies they hear and what are the Bible truths that dispel those lies and then encouraging them to, to, to write them down and use that as a kind of, if you like, you know, spiritual warfare um, in the week. So... What we also introduced with Urban Catechism Part 2 is this idea of performing and pretending, which wasn't my concept. I think I got it from Serge, that's S-E-R-G-E, from the Sonship course, I think possibly. There's a footnote in the actual catechism to, to where I got it from. And it says here that pretending is when we either, one, pretend that our sin isn't as bad as it really is, or two, pretend we are holier than we really are, and performing, on the other hand, is when we do things to make ourselves acceptable to God or to other people. And then we'll give people a bunch of things and ask them to think about, is this performing or pretending or, or is it maybe both? So, for example, the first one there is, I hear God's law say, do not steal. I respond by telling myself that I'm not breaking this command because I haven't robbed any shops. It's true that I've got some pirated music and videos, but that's not really stealing. So right there, we're, we're trying to help one another see that often we perform or pretend instead of going to the cross, instead of relying on what Jesus has done for us at the cross. So we want to make people aware of this because it's something that gets in the way of that. And, and we want to cast that aside and focus on what Jesus has done for us at the cross and be honest about our sin. So once you've done Urban Catechism Part 3, we would then encourage you to have someone take you through Urban Catechism Part 3. Sorry. I said that wrong, didn't I? So once you've been through Urban Catechism Part 2, we then encourage you to have someone take you through Part 3. And Part 3 deals with the 10 commandments. Okay, so for each commandment, we look at what's the good we can do we look at what's the bad we should avoid, and we look at how does this commandment point us to Christ, uh, which are yeah, very influenced by the, the Westminster Catechism, if anyone's familiar with that old catechism. So, for example, when we look at the, the ninth commandment, right, in the catechism it says, how are we to live in light of the ninth commandment? And it's just said what the ninth commandment is, and then it says, we are to avoid the sin of gossip, deceitfulness, and injustice and instead to speak up against injustice and speak the truth in love. Okay, and then, and then we give some information about the definition of gossip. And then, uh, then on the next question, it says, how does the ninth commandment point us to Christ? We fail to obey this, but Jesus lived this out perfectly in our place and provides forgiveness for us. He always spoke the truth in love. So... So right here, we then look at how we might have been performing or pretending with the, with the ninth commandment. Uh, like, for example, we often pretend we don't gossip. Performing, on the other hand, can involve us feeling terribly condemned whenever we do gossip. Performing can also involve us looking down on other people who gossip because we feel that we don't gossip like them. And then we've got some of the lies that we believe uh, like, although I'm annoyed at them, I shouldn't talk to them about it because that will ruin the friendship. Maybe I should just talk to someone else. Truth, keeping stuff bottled up will ruin the friendship. But more importantly, Jesus has commanded you to talk to them privately. Now, now obviously, with, with this stuff here, it's not talking about when there's power differentials. That's, that's a whole uh, another chestnut, and we, and we deal with that in the, in the catechism as well. Um, so then at the end, you've got, pray together using these points, confess pretending and performing and failing to obey this commandment, ask forgiveness, thank Jesus for living out this commandment perfectly in our place, ask for the Spirit's help to obey this command. And then it says, add truths 
to your armory are true from pray through them during the week that's something we got from uh the beyond duct tape workbook um this whole idea of having an armory of truth what they call an arsenal of truth that throughout the week you've got a whole bunch of verses and stuff that you can look at to focus on the truths that you've been learning from god's word okay so when you finish urban catechism part three you've had a pretty good basis then when you've gone through all the questions people keep asking christians and then you've gone through part two about salvation about being justified, about being regenerated, uh, all these kind of things. And then part three, you've gone through the Ten Commandments. And then lastly, we have the Image Bearers booklet, which again is an A5 size booklet. And this looks at what does it mean to be made in God's image, right? And with this, there's more in-depth self-analysis and emphasis on change from the inside rather than external cultural forces. The reason being why is that particularly on, in council state ministry and in urban ministry in the UK, what we've seen is that if you're from the subdominant culture, if you're not from the majority culture, when you get discipled, you get encouraged to become like the dominant culture. And you end up feeling like you need to assimilate to that culture. And then you can get kind of confused where you think that's what it means to be more like Christ. So in the UK, a lot of people say that they, they felt like they had to become white middle class. And what we want to say instead is, no, God's given you a certain culture and he's given you a certain personality. And we want to see your heart be changed each day by the gospel that you become more and more like christ within your cultural framework and within the personality that god has has given you and so we're, we're emphasizing heart change here so for example we look at something like relationships as one of the parts of the image bearers booklet and we say there's two different ways to have relationships right you've got workspace relationship where the people you like the most are the ones who kind of tick all your boxes of what you see as a, a good friend, yeah? And then there's grace-based relationships where it's actually based on, on grace. And we will have these diagnostic questions for people to do, which you can see on, on the right. So, for example, you've got something like, um, which of these things do you find hinder you accepting people? Right. And then you've got something like uh, they seem selfish. If, if, you, if there's some people that you find hard to accept, you think they seem selfish, you tick that box. And then the next column says, do you have the same root sin? And the question is, are you ever selfish? Or well, yeah, blatantly. Does God still accept you? Yeah, he does. Why? Be, because of the, the cross. And then the next column, what might repentance include? Confessing my selfishness, accepting and viewing other selfish people as just like me. Okay, so what, what we're looking at there is as you go through the process of it, you get convicted of stuff, you repent of stuff. There's heart change that leads to outward changes, but it's not you trying to assimilate to another culture. So th then basically apply, rinse and repeat. You keep going through this process so that after a while you're like, Do you know what, I've, I've taken a bunch of people through this catechism. I've taken some people through part two and part three as well, image bearers. Uh, I've had people take me through the process. I've been convicted. I feel like it's, it's helped me become more like Christ. It's helped me know my Bible better, understand my salvation better. It's prepared me to be able to answer people quicker. I mean, I even, I use this for stuff like, just even stuff like emergency counseling. I've had situations where, you know, you got emergency see counsel someone in the middle of the night and something comes up and you know, you can't suddenly now start doing an in-depth Bible study with someone you know, but you can quickly take them to a picture in the catechism and you can show them, show them a picture in the, in the catechism. I once had someone who is, is in a terrible way, something really bad had happened to them and they were saying, I don't, I don't know, I feel like maybe I deserve this or something, you know, and I was like, oh, I've got to quickly explain that, you know, and, 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 and basically I quickly took them to um, this picture here. 
you know, of, of, of a gun. And I said, it's kind of like there's an empty gun. If, if God, if, if you imagine kind of like the bullets in the gun being like God's anger for sin, there are no bullets left in, in the gun. If God was to point at you, it would just go click. There, there, there's no bullets in there. Why? Because God willingly took those bullets on himself at the cross. The son said, he willingly said, I will go and take the anger for all the, all the wrong of anyone who believes in me on the cross, you know? And so, and so then we say, so it's not like God's not like an angry dad, like looking at you wanting to, to punish you, you know? And so things like, so I find that I often draw for the, the pictures in this book, just to quickly explain stuff to, to people. And it means in the end, everyone is is equipped to explain god's truths in real simple ways that don't require them having like a, a theology degree or or whatnot so anyway that is that is the process of uh, a system that i came up with for how we can grow in discipleship i'm not saying everyone should use this system but i would encourage you to think of ways that you can do discipleship that is easily duplicatable it, that easily multiplies without having to have specialists that you can have one ordinary person take some other ordinary person through something and then they take someone else through it and they can take it. and something that you can take all the different social classes through should be able to take a homeless person through your discipleship process and and we have done that at, at new life church and and you should be able to say to someone who was homeless now can you take someone else through this process like we shouldn't have processes that are too complicated to make disciples because we want to see as many people as possible hear god's word and become more and more like christ